Werner is a world-class champion free diver. If you don't know what free diving is, it's when you deep sea dive without an oxygen tank. And Kimmy Werner says that she can, when she dives, she dives down to about 159 feet, way down. And she can stay underwater for like four minutes, she says in 47 seconds. She knows exactly how long she can stay under. She says there's one rule. She says there's the number one, the biggest rule of free diving is this. When you feel the need to speed up, slow down. Do just the opposite. She said, because when you're free diving, things will happen that frighten you and fear kicks in. And you're, you start thinking about how far you are from air up at the surface. And she said, your natural instinct is to swim faster and kick harder. She says, but if you swim faster and kick harder, you burn more oxygen. Your heart rate increases. All of a sudden, you can't stay underwater very long at all. So when you feel fear, when you feel the need to speed up, she says, slow down. She says, when you slow down, you burn less oxygen, your heart rate lowers, you can stay underwater longer. And she says, the best thing is you can think more clearly and make the best decisions and it keeps you alive. She said this was especially true. Recently, she said she was, she was free diving and she lives in Hawaii, by the way, and she turned around and here was a great white shark right behind her, a giant great white shark. And she said instinctively, she wanted to swim for the surface, swim as fast as she could, but she said, I knew I could not swim faster than a great white. So, so all of her training all kicked in and she said, so I did the opposite of swimming faster. I slowed down and I turned toward the shark instead of away from the shark. Well, she said the shark was so confused by this that the shark slowed down. In fact, so slow his tail wasn't even moving and then he coasted up next to her and here's what happened next. She reached out and grabbed his fin. Who would do that? And so here's the thing. She says, when you slow down, you never know what will happen next. And isn't that the great lesson in life here? That when we feel the need to speed up, slow down. We make better decisions. We treat people better. And you never know what will happen next. Uh, If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 11. We started this series last week on less. And last, uh, last Sunday, Nathan kicked it off with a great sermon on less of me and more of God. But in this series, we want to talk about we live in a consumer society where we're being told more and more and more, but eventually you hit a point of diminishing returns and more becomes less, and you have less of everything. And we want to talk about how a, the simple life, the biblical life of less is actually the best life, the most meaningful life. And so today I want to talk about less hurry. When we hurry less, we can spend more time, give more of our presence to the people who matter most and to God. So we see this in Jesus's life. He addresses this issue of rushing and hurrying. And he says this in Matthew 11. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to to take a real rest Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything too heavy on you or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. Maybe you showed up this morning and you feel like you're running on empty. Maybe this morning or, or even over the last few weeks, you feel like when you lay in bed, your heart starts to race. And maybe you feel there's so much pressure at work, you can hardly breathe. And I want to say today, I want to say the challenge, the invitation is to create space and margins in your life to breathe, to catch that breath. Kim Werner talks about taking one deep breath, and that's enough for almost five minutes. The problem is we live, live these hurried, rushed lives uh, and, and, and we become short on space for everything, the people we love, and especially for God. The problem is, is that we live in a speed culture, don't we? We try to do more and more and less and less time. Doesn't it feel every day like you're in a race to something, like a race against the clock? There's a finish line you never reach. And if you think about it, it's true. It used to be 
we would read books. Now, most of my friends listen to books. In fact, two friends that I talked to recently about their audiobooks, they said, yeah, Palmer, I listen at triple speed. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe they're on to something. So I tried chip triple speed. It makes you insane. It's like listening to chipmunks. And, <laughs> and who wants to read a book like that? You get all worked up and, and irritated. And, and if a book isn't meant to be read like that. We used to take walks. Remember that? Now I hear people do speed walking. <laughs> uh, there used to be dating. Some of you dated. Now there's speed dating. I wonder how that's working out for some people. And there used to be sports like baseball and golf that were America's pastime and were meant to be relaxing. But now when you play golf, they say, don't even bother taking the flag stick out. That's a new rule. Uh, and, 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 and now I've heard there's even speed golf. This is professional speed golf. You sprint from shot to shot. I haven't tried it yet. I don't plan on trying it. And by the way, I've heard you can even sign up for speed yoga. Now that's, that's an oxymoron for you. I don't know if you can do that. But the thing is, is that all the hurrying, all the rushing around, eventually it damages the soul. The soul was not meant to hurry. And we crash and we burn out and we hit a breaking point. Sometimes we have a wake-up call. Maybe you've hit that point where you have a wake-up call. Maybe your wake-up call from all the hurrying and all the rushing is that you became sick. A lot of the America's sicknesses right now are tied to the rushing and the stress and the hurry and the anxiety that we carry around. Maybe your wake-up call is you lost a client who you ignored for too long. Maybe your wake-up call, and the worst one is you lost a friend or someone that you love because you ignored them too much. And today I want to talk about slowing down in order that for us to love the ones who God put in our lives and love him more. My wake-up call for me, and I've had quite a few, I think, over the course of my life, but one that sticks out was years ago when my sons were small, I was reading to them in bed. And we're reading, I think it was Bernstein Bears, and I'm flipping through, and of course, I needed to get somewhere. I'm not sure, but it was important. And one of them stopped me. They said, Dad, you're skipping pages. Now, here's the thing. We had like 50 of those books, but they had every page memorized. Kids are smart. And so, but it hit me in that moment, Palmer, why are you rushing? What in the world could be more important than the next 15 or 20 minutes with your sons? And I've thought about it now. Now they're too old for me to read to. They're like in their 20s, 20, 23, 24 years old. And plus some of them are married and they don't let me read to them. And plus that'd be very weird. And, um, but I thought this, if I could do it all over again, I would read slower and maybe I wouldn't read just Bernstein Bear's book. I'd find longer books like War and Peace <laughs> and, and just read till the sun came up. Because there's no, nothing in life more important than the people that God puts in front of you to love. I have a, a list here that I put together of signs that maybe you've been rushing around in life. I'll, I'll start with this. If you've been testy, well, that's one of the signs, aggressive, anxious, uh, relationally shallow, skipping from one person to the next, emotionally numb to people, overworking all the time, avoiding things, responsibilities, and drifting from God. I think it happens to all of us. I think, I think maybe this, if I think about my own life, I can't think of a single thing that I've ever gained from rushing around. I think when we rush around and hurry, we end up offending people more than we do blessing them with anything that we've done. I was walking into a Starbucks this weekend, and as soon as I walked in, I heard the door open behind me, and someone followed me in, and I'm walking to the, to the cash register to order. But this person, they speed walk. I guess they've been practicing, and they passed me on the way to the cash register. And I was like, wow, that was cold. That was ice cold. Maybe I stayed too long at the donut counter. Maybe I slowed down just slightly, but not that much. But all you do is end up offending people when you rush around. I, this last weekend, we had man camp, and we had about 70 guys down in Mexico. And men, if you're here this morning and you missed man camp, you missed one of my favorite weekends we've had ever at the Grove. Anyway, so after we're, we're leaving Rocky Point and there's three guys in my car, we get to the border, but the line at the border was like a mile long. And we literally... Uh, we're in line for like an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes. And just when the, 
the, the gate is close enough to see the border gate, I see some trucks coming down the shoulder of the road. And I'm like, oh no. And I look in my rear view mirror. I'm like, can I get over to cut them off? And then I see their zony license plates. They're all zonies. And they're pulling toy haulers and quads and rails and things like that. And about five of them go past us. And, and on the inside, I'm raging, okay? But I'm staying really calm because I'm a pastor and I have three people from the Grove <laughs> in my car. So I say really calm through this. And, and then, but then about 10 minutes later, we start pulling closer to, to the border and those guys can't get back in. Nobody's letting them in. And one of them wants to nose in. He's trying to nose in front of me. And my first thought is, well, the Bible says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, show them grace, show them love. And I thought about all those things. And I thought about that was the right thing to do. And, and then I just laid on my horn, <laughs> just <laughs> honk. And, and I'm going to blame the guys in the car. They were just egging me on. Guys like Alan Gavin was just saying, you know, you know don't let them in, don't let them in. <laughs> No, that was my, but here's the thing. So we, uh, I watch them after I don't let them in, they call over a beef jerky vendor and they buy about five pounds worth of beef jerky. Then they must've tipped him big because he goes behind my car, drops the rest of his beef jerky on the ground and acts like he's picking it up. So the car can't move and they pull in behind me. Just dirt bags, right? Filthy animals. I don't, that's what happened there. But if you think about it, nothing ever good comes out of rushing around. But rushing and hurrying, when we live like that, it drains our soul. We start to live with a low-grade depression, a low-grade fatigue. And so Jesus says this, Matthew eleven twenty-nine. 29. He says, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Uh, and Jesus is not saying here, he's not saying be lazy, work less, hard, not at all. He says there's a rhythm to life. He says there's a time to push and, and, and there's a time to work hard and there's time to be up and get it done. But then there's a time to have space and, and spend time with the people who God put in your life to love and to pay attention to. We do better when we slow down. In our culture, I think, and maybe our, the issue is how we perceive time, because in other cultures outside of the United States, they don't see us as running out of time. Nobody talks like that. Where I grew up in Africa, for example, they see, they see time as a big revolving circle that just keeps refreshing and renewing itself. That tomorrow is, every, every, is always there. In Malawi, we say mawa, tomorrow. In Mexico, you know, they say manana. If you can't get it done today, we'll get it done tomorrow. It's not a big deal. But in our culture, we see, lot, we see time very linear. We see it as an asset, but it's a depreciating asset. And, and we see it as something that's valuable, that if we don't use it, it's going to be gone forever. And maybe we can b- blame Benjamin Franklin. He was the first one to say, time is money. And that really messes with us psychologically, doesn't it? Because we feel like if we waste any time, it's gone for good. That if we don't hurry up and get things done, it's gone for good. And it's just not that way. So this morning, I want to look at a way to slow down in order for us to be fully present with those who God puts in our lives to love the most. Here's a solution. I'll start with this simple thought, is to hurry less. And if you turn over in your Bibles from Matthew, turn to Mark chapter 5, and we'll spend the rest of the morning in Mark chapter 5 and Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 5, we see that Jesus is teaching, and a man named Jairus, and he's a religious leader, he comes up and he interrupts him. And by the way, there was never an interruption that we read of in the Gospels that Jesus doesn't take. He saw every interruption as a divine interruption. He made time for everyone who interrupted him. But Jairus comes up and he says, hey, master, my my daughter is sick. I think she's going to die. And so he says, can you come to my house and heal her? And so Jesus and Jairus start to walk to his house. But while they're on the way to Jairus' house, another woman interrupts Jesus, and he stops. He has an appointment. He has somewhere to be, places to go, but he stops. And she says, I'm sick. I'm dying. Can you save me? And he stops, and he heals her. And as he's talking to her, a messenger comes from Jairus' house, and the messenger says, uh, don't bother the teacher. He doesn't have to come. Uh, he says, the, the, um, your daughter has already died. 
And, and Jesus says, no, she hasn't died. She's just sleeping. And they mock him. He gets to the house and they mock him. They said, if you had heard, she, she would have made it. He says, no, she's fine. And he walks in the room and he takes her hand and he says, Talitha Kahum, little girl, get up. And she gets up. See, for Jesus, he realized that I think we do everything better when we slow down. We treat people better when we slow down. We have time for the least and the little ones like Jesus did when we slow down. And like I said, I think we do everything in life better if we slow down. We eat better when we slow down. We live better. We do our work. We do our careers go better when we slow down. I think we love God better when we slow down. We, we love our wives and our husbands and our children, our sons and our daughters better when we slow down. I've heard that now there's even a international slow down movement. And for example, part of this movement is schools around the world are canceling homework for their students. This is true. I just want to know why didn't this movement start when I was in high school? Because I would have been the first to sign up. But for example, there's a school in Scotland, and the school is for high achieving kids. And you think, and in spite of it being all high achieving kids at a private school, the principal realized the kids were burning out. So the principal canceled homework, said, and banned homework for all kids under the age of 13. The trouble is that the high achieving kids, they had high achieving parents. Uh, they were lawnmower helicopter parents, and all of these parents came to the principal uh, attacking her, angry saying, our kids are not going to make it. They're not going to get into the best colleges. And the principal said, no, your sons and daughters need to decompress. They need the downtime. They need to breathe. They need that space to breathe. They've been going, going all morning. They can't go all afternoon and night. They have important things to do, like Fortnite, things like that, (laughs) things like that. But here's what happened. In spite of the parents' concerns, after, the, after one semester, all of those kids' scores in math and science were up by 20%. That's what happened there. I have this key idea on the screen, if you want to look at it with me, uh, is that once we eliminate the things that don't matter, we give our, our time, by the way, to things that don't matter much at all. We are able to pour our life, our time, attention, and love into all the things that really do matter and into the ones who we love and to God. That's, that's the invitation here this morning. I have two, two charts here this morning, and maybe you see yourself in one of them. Maybe you've been living this busy life, scattered, going in 20 directions, trying to tr- please all kinds of people. But the simple life, the life of less, means that it's okay to focus on one thing and get that thing done as well as I can. But here's the challenge. If you're going to be a person who slows down to give your life to what matters most, to give your life to the people who matters most, you will have to eliminate the things that I'll describe this morning as the non-essentials. I think every day we spend at least half of our day, half of our our week pursuing things that are non-essentials. So I want to invite you, I want to challenge you to think about what are the non-essentials, the things I've been doing to please other people maybe that I need to eliminate from my life. Bob Goff, who's the author of Love Does, he says that Thursday is his quitting day. On Thursday, every Thursday, he quits something. It's his day to eliminate something, to eliminate a non-essential. He says he quits things like maybe a gym membership. I don't know, something he's not using. Uh, or I'm sure he has another gym membership, but he cancels one. Uh, maybe it's quitting paying taxes for you. I don't know what you need to quit. Maybe all of us need to quit that. But The truth is that our life fills with non-essentials. And my challenge, my invitation this morning is to find out what matters most and give your life to that. I have this sentence here. And if you're writing anything down this morning, write this down. Because every day people invite you or ask you to take on something. So ask yourself this. Is this the most important thing? that I should be doing with my time and my resources right now. Let me read that again. Is this the most important thing that I should be doing with my time and my resources right now? Because every day you're gonna have people ask you to take something on that maybe has nothing to do with your job description or is something that really is their problem and not your problem. And so I have this thought. If you do not determine, if you do not decide 
what matters most in your life, somebody else will do that for you. I have one final thought that I wanna, I wanna challenge you with this morning, and it's this. When we learn to hurry less, something amazing happens, and it's this. We're able to give our presence to the people who God put in our lives to love the most. I have another example from the life of Jesus. Turn over one page in your Bible to Mark chapter 6. And he has these 12 disciples that he's trying to pour into. And here's what we read happens, verse 31. Because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. Jesus said to his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Do you see this? So Jesus says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. And he takes the 12 that he's trying to pour into away from the crowds. He's trying to eliminate all of the noise in order to, for him to focus on these 12 the most. I wonder how many times a week you need to do this. I think that once we eliminate the things that don't matter much at all, we're able to pour our love and attention into, into the ones that really do matter. The thing is, is that when we get crazy busy, we tend to forget things, don't we? That's one of the, one of the casualties. We, we forget appointments, we forget birthdays, we forget anniversaries, but worse than that, we forget friendships. Sometimes we even forget about our own family, about our own children. Uh, this happened once in our life. What happened is we had just started the Grove here in Chandler. We're meeting in a school cafeteria down Gilbert Road. Veronica and I had only been here like three or four months. And on one Sunday, my parents were landing at Sky Harbor from Africa. So I left right after the service, rushed to pick them up, and she went home to make dinner. And so I brought them back to the house, and she has dinner ready, and we sat down for dinner, and then our doorbell rang. And I go to the door, and here's a really nice couple from this new church we're starting, the Grove, and they have our four-year-old son. And they said, they said, you left him at church. And they looked all judgmental and things. And so... I smiled and said to them, I said, hey, Jesus' parents left him at church, you know, <laughs> and how'd that work out? <laughs> they didn't think it was funny. They never, they thought they were judging. Some of you are judging me right now, but I know you've done it. Some of you are judging me right now, but that's okay. I know you. I, uh, I have this, this chart on the screen if you want to look at it with me, because in this crazy busy life we try to leave, there's this voice saying, for example, the busy life says, be everything for everyone. The simple life says, less is better. The busy life says, I have to. The, the simple life says, I want to. The busy life says, everything is urgent. The simple life says, only a few things actually really matter. The busy life says, I need more time to do it all. The simple life says, uh, I will focus on what matters most. And so my invitation here is to give your presence to the people who matter the most. Maybe your day, maybe your week kind of looks like this. Maybe you're hurrying and you're going all kinds of places and never getting anything done. I want to invite, invite you to the life of less. The less we do, the better we do it if we focus on the most important things and give our lives to that. I think the most painful thing the greatest tragedy of hurry and busyness is that it diminishes our capacity to love. I've heard it said that hurry kills love. If you have been rushing and hurrying and busy, then love is suffering. Someone who you're trying to love is suffering right now. Here's a, the final challenge that I want to give you this morning, and it's this. That the less we hurry, the more we're able to live and dwell in the presence of God. If we pick up where we left off reading in Mark chapter six, we read that Jesus had said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. And so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Move down to verse 46. After leaving them, Jesus went up on a mountainside to pray. Uh, even Jesus, even the son of God, knew that he needed space, margin in his day to, uh, to pray. He knew, I think he knew what all of us should know, that if we 
hurry and we rush, we're going to end up being spiritually shallow people. Spiritual directors, one of the first things they tell people who they're coaching is, you will have to slow down. You will have to create space and margins if you're going to be close to God. There's a, there's a well-known missionary from the 20th century, the mid-20th century. Her name is Letty Kalman. Letty Kalman lived in Japan. She was also a prolific writer. And Letty Kalman writes about a woman who goes to Africa to visit a work in Africa. And she had landed in a city, and, she, and the, the only way to where she was going to this remote mission station was to walk for almost three days. And so she gathered some of the, the Africans who were taking her together, and they started off walking. And she says, we got to walk fast. We got a long way to go. So she made them walk almost 20 miles the first day. And they, they covered a, a huge amount of ground in that first day. Well, they camped. The next morning she got up and she got ready to go, but all of the Africans with her were not ready to leave. She says, hey, we've got to go. It's time to go. Uh, We got a lot of ground to cover in one day. And they said, you know what, Uh, ma'am? They said, yesterday we walked a long way in a very short time. So right now, we're not going to go anywhere today. We're going to wait and let our souls catch up with our bodies. (laughs) Isn't that true? That in America, we think we can go and go and push it and push it, but we become spiritually shallow and hollow. And I wonder how many of us this morning need to slow down and let our souls catch up with our bodies. Some call it soul fatigue. The soul was never meant to hurry and and rush around. The, the, The price we pay is that when we are hurried and rushed and crazy busy, We can never live and dwell, truly dwell in the presence of the Spirit of God. And that's the invitation that I want to land on today. I want to invite you to learn to dwell in the presence of the Spirit of God. When we read the Bible, there's a word used, a Hebrew word that we translate as a word spirit from the Old Testament to the New Testament to talk about the Spirit of God. The the Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach just doesn't mean spirit. For the Hebrew people, the word ruach, ruach also means breath, to breathe. Ruach also means life. In other words, if you don't breathe, you won't have life. You'll be dead. So breath and life are the same word. Breath and, and spirit and life are all the same words. It means air and motion, ruach. Uh, for example, in, in Psalms chapter 51, we read, "'Cast me not away from your presence.'" And take not your ruach, take not your spirit away from me. The point the Bible is making is through this Hebrew word ruach, that the spirit of God is with us and in us every moment of every day. With every breath you take, wherever you are breathing and alive, the spirit of God, the ruach of God is present. He's there. If you think about your breathing, I don't know if you know this, that we all take about 26,000 breaths a day. We breathe in about 4,000 gallons of air. We're supposed to, the most healthy way to breathe is from deep down in our stomach. And we're meant to breathe maybe four to six times a minute. That's how many breaths we're supposed to take. But when you rush and when you hurry, We end up taking very shallow, short breaths from high in our chest, almost in our neck. We breathe like 18, 20, 22 times a minute because we're so stressed and we're so anxious, we can hardly catch our breaths. And when we live like that, we can't dwell in the presence of the Spirit of God. Today, I wanna invite you to rediscover this life of breathing in the presence of God and knowing with every breath you take, He's right there with you. 